And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Mechanical Muse, creator of the Ataltis campaign setting, and now expanding it further with Guardians of Agthor, the one and only Mark Tassin. Hello, thanks for having me here. Thank you for com thank you for coming on, um, and in and enjoy and bearing with and bearing with time zone and scheduling hell. It's not a problem. I'm used to it. No, um, I ar I already had cur I've already cursed the name of of Australia because of the whole half hour time zones that they that they introduced. Right. <laughs> But I suppose it's par for the course because everything in Australia wants to kill you. So I guess that has to include the time the time zones as well. It would make sense. They're staying true to form. So I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, as I often do in this show. With that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? All right. Well, I, you know, I actually kind of found role-playing games accidentally. I was in seventh grade, and I signed up for a, a program in the summer where a guy was teaching war games, which was pretty fantastic because they did historical war gaming with like a 30-foot-long table, and it was pretty amazing. But the folks at the other table over were playing some other crazy game, and I checked it out, and I said, well, what is this? And they go, well, this is Dungeons & Dragons. You should totally try it. So I... Sure enough, when the wargaming session was over, I signed up for the Dungeons & Dragons game and got introduced to my first game of D&D. Watched my four-hit-point wizard die a horrific death, and yet somehow that made me that much more excited to play the game again. And honestly, ever since that day, I have been gaming weekly pretty much since then, just uh, with without break since that day. If I can take a shot in the dark... Was the version that you got introduced um, Beck Me? It was actually AD&D First Edition. Now, oh, Beck Me, I had the red box was my first box, so when my parents went out and bought something for me, that's what they bought me. And so that could either that could either be BX or Beck Me, but Beck Me is the one I tend when people when people start out started out with First Edition. Um, mm -hmm. Beck me or AD and D is usually the most common result I get. Sometimes yeah. I'll get BX if I'm lucky. Rarely do I get um, Mold of A or Cook. No, no, no. It, we didn't do that. I didn't do that one. But AD and D was really what I first started playing. And when I bought more books myself, I bought AD and D first edition books. So that's where I that's where I started from. Mm -hmm. And. With that, with that in mind, I'd like. Were you a were you a one system guy for for most of those years, or did you experiment with other systems o with time? Well, I, I was a one company guy, right? I was all TSR, and I didn't really know that there were other games and uh, other things out there until I got to college. Quite frankly, all through middle school and high school, all I played was. You know, top secret and actually uh, before before you get into that, I'd like I'd like to play a bit of a lightning round. I'll give you, okay. I'll give you, I'll give you names, and All right. you can tell me if you pl if you played it, if you didn't play it, um, if you eh, and any miscellaneous detail you you can think of. Um, now, within what time frame are we talking? Like before I graduated from high school, basically, or are you talking throughout my history of gaming? B. Okay, got it. I can do that. Oh. Uh, I'm mostly going to focus on TSR for the sake of my sanity in this. Okay. Um, Boot Hill. Yes. Star Frontiers. Absolutely. Yes. Top Secret. Yep. Top Secret SI. Yes. Um, the um, MSH, or Marvel Phase Rip. That was my second favorite after AD&D. Yeah. yeah. Loved it. 
Some people call it MSH. I prefer calling it Marvel Phase Rip. Yeah, and then there's AMSH because of advanced Marvel superheroes, which is different than the basic. So you know, technically. Well, to be fair, to be fair, the basic didn't have any character creation rules. <laughs> right. Because they assu they assumed that people would want to play as um, Captain America or Sp or Spider Man or the Punisher or whatnot, which wasn't a wasn't a smart move. Um, mm -hmm. This is a bit of a deep cut, but I hope to God you didn't you didn't suffer through the Indiana Jones RPG that TSR made. It's possible I did, <laughs> and Conan for that matter. <laughs> the Con the Conan one isn't isn't too bad. I do prefer the Zephyrus, which is basically that, but a bit more cleaned up. Yeah. Um, unless we're talking those AD and D Conan modules, those kind of stunk. Yeah, can I can I say both? Because yeah, both. Uh, all right. Um, either of the Saga System games, those being Dragonlance Fifth Age and uh, Marvel Adventure. Yes, I've played Saga, uh, Dragonlance. I played a single game of Marvel Adventure and just never got around to getting more games in. Mm -hmm. Um. I think there was, um, I remember that there was, oh, this is a bit, this is a bit of a, this is a bit of a deeper cut from the earlier days, but Chainmail. I have never played Chainmail. Nope, that's the one I have never touched. <laughs> um, um, which isn't too surprising because that was, that was very limited and truth be told, look, I have read through the rules for Chainmail and it is primitive now i played the later revised brought back out edition of chainmail that was came out years later and just never quite took off but yeah. you know totally different ball game there um blade storm no no blade storm and i've talked i talked about this early earlier today but um one glorious slice of cheese dragon strike Yes, I have. It was a long time ago. Yeah, and I've got it down in the basement. <laughs> I one of these. I don't have any plans on actually running Dragon Strike through Tabletop Simulator or anything like that. But one of these days, I want to do a watch and react and react on this channel to the Dragon Strike VHS because the whole thing's been uploaded to YouTube for years. Oh my gosh, that'd be amazing. That'd be absolutely amazing. Um now. Birthright counts, right? I mean, it, it's AD and D, but it's its own system. Yeah, I, yeah, I'll I will, I will count, I will count it. Um, Buck Rogers. No, but I own it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I it. I've I've gone on record <laughs> saying that I think I think Buck Rogers would have been better off um, being a backdoor second edition to Star Frontiers instead of trying to um, kit bash AD and D into it. Mm. Yeah. You're probably right. Um Crime Fighters. No. See now you're getting into stuff that I definitely that I'm a little embarrassed when you're asking me. So I'm like, no, not that one. <laughs> um Gangbusters. Yes. Yes, I have played Gangbusters. As an aside, it's really confusing to have to have to have the fact that both of them that th that they came out, that they came out with one within one year of each other and they're dipping in similar ponds. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, alternity. Yes, definitely played alternity. Mm -hmm. Um, I liked alternity's setting, man. I don't know, it's just something about it was worked for me. I do enjoyed it. To, I do want to tackle alternity at one point, but I do, but. It's a matter of figuring out which edition and having to find a way to summarize all the jump, all the system jumping that Alternity did over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, Metamorphosis Alpha. Metamorphosis Alpha. I have not played it. No. Um, Empire of the Petal Throne. No. Oh man. Uh. Apparently. 
Apparently there was apparently in '88 they had a Bullwinkle and Rocky game. I completely forgot about that. Oh yeah, there was, and I haven't played, but I know it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, amazing engine. Oh yeah, I definitely. I in fact, I first got introduced to it with the free when they gave it away free in Dragon Magazine after they couldn't get people to buy it. Mm -hmm. They put like the basic book and just stapled it into the middle of Dragon. Um, did you ever have? Did you ever have the more crayon e dice, the ones that you're supposed to write the numbers in yourself? Not only did I have them, I actually had the display box that came out with the original random number generators, as they called them, from back in the AD and D days that I sold at the Gen Con auction one year, and it came. I got like twenty sets of dice, brand new in their boxes, that I gave away to people for christmas presents one year so yes absolutely i've colored in many dice with crayons over the years including the waxy ones that slowly wear down into a little ball over time as the corners wear off them yeah and of course there's there's a bunch of there's a bunch of board game um did you ever have any of the um game any of the game books like like choose your own adventure or um endless quest i am literally sitting behind a shelf Filled with Choose Your Own Adventures, Lone Wolf, Endless Quest, Fighting Fantasy, you name it, I've got them. Mm -hmm. um, Love them. Does that include Lone Wolf? Yep, Lone Wolf, I've got up there. Advanced uh, Endless Quest, yeah. which are only a couple of. Um, Zork. Yeah, when it... Um, funny enough, I ended up discovering Zork when I was, when I was researching the early history of video game RPGs. Oh yeah, uh, and th that's how I found out that um, the earliest for the pre the predecessor to MMOs, MUDs, were based mm -hmm. on an unlicensed port of Zork. Yep, because in fact, I was a MUD programmer. That's where I learned to. That's actually, I actually studied opera performance in school, mm -hmm. but I spent all of my free time in the computer labs with my engineering buddies learning to program an LPC, which is a variant of C, so that I could write code for MUDs. Mm -hmm. And that's why I work in computers today and actually make a living as opposed to being an unemployed opera singer. Yeah, and you, prob you, probably, you probably are familiar with the programmer's drinking code, or the coder's drinking code. The uh, coder's not off the top of my oh, head, maybe coders, I know. The coder's but... drinking song, let me say it properly. Okay. Um. 99 little bugs in the code, 99 bugs in the code, you take one down, you patch it around, 287 bugs in the code. I am familiar, yes. <laughs> yeah. Every time I sing that, anybody who knows coding winces in pain because they know it's true. It's so true. It's like hurtfully, painfully true. Um, but and, and I, Go ahead. <laughs> as a wise man once said, truth is the greatest comedy. Um. Did you ever have any uh, any of the decks from the old, from the old Spellfire card game? I did. Yeah, I never actually like played the card game, but I had the decks and always thought how cool it would be to actually play it. it was... I think it was an interesting idea. It's just that it was it was very it was very it was very clear that it was that it was made to tr that it it was made tr it was made with the intent of we need to compete with Magic: The Gathering, which came which came out um, shortly a shortly after, because the thing because Spellfire came out in '94. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had James Ward on; and he's talked about it, and he de he defends it, but that le but th the really lousy t the lousy timing I think didn't help matters. Mm hmm. Uh, and if I'm being honest, I look at it as a precursor to what um warlord was trying to do when that came out from alderac and was mm -hmm. billed as the game you already know how to play <laughs> cuz the whole idea is to take is to take the is to take D, D stuff and put and put it into a card game um it's not a it's not a terrible idea Now I think it's unfair if we don't mention Dungeon, which was one of my all-time favorite board games. In fact, yeah. it's what I taught my kids to uh, when we first started playing D and D board games. We would play Dungeon. It's kind of it's kind of funny that that Dungeon 
had been around for so long, and yet the whole point of Dragon Strike was to teach people how to play D and D. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not entirely sure if Dragon Strike was successful in that front, because I think people remember it more for it jumping on the board game VHS hybrid bandwagon that was around in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. That was a really horrifying time. Now, fast forward for two minutes. <laughs> God, um, I had a Star Wars game like that. Yeah. For the longest time, there was, this, there was this really bad habit of board games being built around gimmicks. Mm-hmm. Around, a, around a single gimmick. And this is... This isn't ju- this isn't just in the niche end of end of things. Um, consider 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 some of the some of the other board games that were put out by the big th- by the big three. Um, something like Mousetrap, for instance. Mm-hmm. Like everybody messed around with the trap, but nobody actually played the board game. <laughs> um, <laughs> the original Dark Tower is another example where the tower itself is cool, but the but playing the game itself not so much. Right. Or you have those electronic variants of of established board games like say Battleship. Um or the or the or that we or that wheel spinning thing in the game of life, which I I'd imagine was probably the most expensive part of that game. Well, and there was a, a dungeon exploration game. I'm trying to remember what it was called. I've got it downstairs. It's got this tower at one end of it and this dice instead of rolling dice you shake a little sword with little colored balls in it and the whole thing was just so elaborate to set up that once you set it up you just you can't take it apart again it's just too complicated to put it all together and then when you play it it's just kind of dull (laughs) so all the secret doors and everything sort of all go to waste once you start actually playing the game yeah like like i said it um I think some people got some people got in the room and said, "What if what if, wouldn't it be cool if we put if we built a game around this gimmick?" But they built the gimmick, but they spent so much time building the gimmick they didn't have enough time to build the game. Right. Oh. I think that's the reason why even years later, stuff like Hero Quest and Talisman is still beloved, and and Monopoly is a Viking death march because of the fact that the the biggest gimmick is having in something like Monopoly. The biggest gimmick is having pewter figures. So you know, I think what's interesting is that the the whole idea of a gimmick in general, people still try to fall back on gimmicks. And the reality is that it, it's not necessarily the 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 best, fanciest, coolest looking thing. It's it's something that that grabs you in another way, that grabs your imagination, that you just can't get enough of. And sometimes it's the worst looking thing in the world, but you just love it, right? Mm-hmm. Dark World was the name of that game, by the way, in case anyone's curious about it. Yeah. Now, I want to make clear, even though I made fun of Dark Tower, um, the Return to Dark Tower board game is not does not have that problem. Mostly, mm-hmm. because, mostly because it's made by people who know what the hell they're doing. Right. But when it comes to... When it comes to... Um, a ta- a Taltus. Yeah. As a as a set as a setting. What what were some of the big inspirations for for that and what style of fantasy are you trying to lean towards because saying that you're ge- saying that you're running a fantasy game all that that makes me do is go do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? Uh, all right. Well, okay. So I I think one of the things that we wanted to try to do and this is where you know, this goes against probably conventional wisdom, but the reality is that we love, love classic fantasy settings like uh, Forgotten Realms and Greyhawk and, you know, even you know, things like Earth Dawn and, and those sorts of, of locations and settings. We think they're fantastic. We think that they, they built this industry in a way because they are so uh, compelling to people. Um, and we have this idea that tropes you know aren't necessarily a bad thing people don't hate tropes they just hate when people do them badly and that's what we've i've been ex- saying for decades <laughs> yeah yeah and it's it's true it's that tropes exist because they they strike a chord and so we were looking at all this and going you know we've explored the realms we've explored greyhawk we've done all these there's you know we just want why can't there just be more of this for people to explore and we said well why don't we just take it rethink some of the stuff for the modern world you know rethink how some of it 
came about and wrap a really cool story around it and just do it really, really well. You know, it's sort of like pizza. Mm -hmm. It's like some places have amazing pizza. It's still pizza, but at the end of the day, it's it's amazing. That's why you keep going back, and that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to make classic fantasy a setting that people are like, yeah, this is home for me. This is where I go. Yeah. Um I have I have lar I have largely to I've largely told people that that um complaining of complaining about some um, about cli about tropes or cliches is yeah. like complaining is like complaining about the brand of paint that an artist uses. Nobody goes up nobody goes up to a carpenter who built their house and asks them what kind of hammers are they using. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. It's but but if the but if the but if if the construction of the house is it is using the is using all the tools but isn't putting them together properly, then people are going to notice. Yeah, and it's the same thing with tr with tropes or mo or motifs. So I've talked about this multiple times on the on the Geek Watch podcast that that I do on Sundays. And sir, and um, truth be told, I always try I always try ins to insist that people not go out of their way to try and avoid certain tropes because in doing so you're going to fall into complete up uh, completely other tropes yeah you know it's, yeah. it's like a it's like avoiding a pitfall by skating into another pitfall mm -hmm. yeah it's absolutely true and i think one of the problems too is when people recognize that a trope has sort of this universal appeal and they try to just cash in on it by using it as opposed to understanding why it has that appeal, or right? Or do the exact op or try to do the exact opposite without thinking it through, like yeah, like say like saying every like saying like saying every this the this um British style style of fan style of fantasy is 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 popular. So let's do the exact opposite so we don't so we don't get lumped in, right? Which is a nice idea, but that's just the first step because now you got to figure out. Okay, what are if we're not doing that? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Um, I have, I guess a good, ex I guess a good example of do of doing of intentionally not doing something, but still managing to st still managing to stay above uh, above ground on things, would be exalted. They didn't want to do Tolkien style fantasy, mm -hmm. so instead they drew more inspiration from from. From manga and from from both Greek from Greco-Roman myth and some aspects of uh, of the of the more over the topness that you see in in um, Hindu myth. Okay. Yeah, and I think that that's a great idea. Is you know, there's so many cool stories to tell that there's no reason not to to choose that path as well. I mean. Both of these things create, both of these approaches can create really cool worlds. And if you love what you're doing and you're doing it because you love it, it's going to show through. And if you think through what you're doing so you do it right, you know, it's going to be successful. Yeah. And this is also the reason why I'm, I'm, not, a I'm not a fan of the term generic fantasy or, the, or, this idea, or this idea about what fantasy is supposed to be. Yeah, because a lot of times when people do that, they're utilizing that Tolkien esque pastiche. And don't get me wrong, I got no, I got nothing but love for the works of Tolkien. I just don't like the idea that that's what I have to do. Mm -hmm. if, I don't, if if I don't want to, I've been writing a setting that's f that is far more inspired by uh by a vit by a lot by a lot of vit by a lot of um. Both video game RPGs and the and the idea of a an, of um a re of a more Renaissance style approach, just just with fantasy, because I've always been a fan of take of taking taking say the tropes of fantasy and then say, okay, how would how would things change when we when we move the technology forward a few, by a few, by a few centuries? Like how would this, yeah. how would this change once once we stop once we exit the high medieval period and start entering the age of pike and shot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's it's absolutely a great way to sort of explore another area that we maybe haven't been to in some cases, and you know, um, 
I think the thing for me is it, when you're taking what I call sort of like classic fantasy, which is where you, you of course, have some of the basics like dwarves and elves and things like that, mm-hmm. where you've got this sort of base concept of classic fantasy, but modern gamers don't want to be pinned down into every dwarf being the exact same dwarf, right? Not That's every dwarf kind has of, to be Gimli. Right, and so one of the things that we ended up doing is in, to sort of facilitate that is we did something I've always wanted to see games do, which is split apart the idea of culture and their race, or what we call lineage, right? So you've got what you are physically, a dwarf, but then you've got your lineage. And your lineage determines things like, are you stubborn by nature? Do you dislike another type of... I mean, your culture determines these things. Your lineage just determines if you have dark vision and things like that. And so you create these cool situations where you could have a dwarf that's raised in the Agthorian lands and has a completely different outlook on life than, say, a dwarf that's raised in Malador and is sort of the classic do it ourselves, build things, you know, stubborn, we don't need your help type of attitude that you see classically in dwarves. And so it gives you the opportunity to play that thing that you're used to or play against it if you want to and have a way to to facilitate that. What I find funny about what you mentioned with that is I remember Level Up 5e when when I talked about that a while back and how it was trying to do do something similar but because of the fact that it's trying to do that it's trying to do the whole setting not setting that D&D has tried to do for years mm-hmm. um, I know some people will argue with me on this but no D&D has had a problem of either shit or get off the pot when it comes to what sort of fantasy it wants to be and but they but the the approach that they ended up taking I thought was a little bit half cocked because they were t- because I don't. I got nothing against anybody who worked on it, but this was an issue that I had personally, where it seemed like they were taking the the tra- the default traits in the core book and just splitting them around between between ra- between race and background. Yeah. Instead, which in that case you're not doing anything new. You're just tr- you're just creating a self licking ice cream cone, as some of my army friends have said. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the things that nice thing about making your own game world is you can sort of start to break some of those rules and do it the way that you've always wished someone would. And the way we've got it set up is you've got lineage, which is basically your genetics, you could say. You've got your culture, which is where you were raised. Now, what's cool about it is that it tells you how people from that culture typically behave. But that's just so you have a baseline. You might go completely against that, but you at least know that you're the odd person out in your culture if you don't behave in that fashion. You know what the norm is, though. Then after that, you've got your background, which is was your what your career was supposed to be. And uh, following that, you choose your calling, which is why you said, I'm not going to be a farmer anymore. Forget that. I'm going to become an adventurer. So you might be an explorer or a bounty hunter. And then your class is just your package of skills and abilities that you use to to perform your calling. Yeah. And each of these have a very specific game purpose that you know help you along the way. Like, for example, your calling will help you to find reasons to say yes to whatever adventure the GM puts on the table. But it also helps to sort of split these ideas out and have you create a character that's a little bit more driven and interesting and focused, you know, why they're there and what they're doing and where they came from. Mm -hmm. Now, a problem that can happen with with campaign with campaign settings and just in universe settings as a whole is a bit is the meta plot issue where it where you end up going so de- when you, where you end up going so detailed that that um that pe- that people have a hard time figuring out where the where the player characters are going to, are going to fit into the picture um, mm-hmm. how how do you approach that by by treating it as a kind of as a kind of points of interest design that you've mentioned on the kickstarter page well, the Kickstarter is we're taking a little bit different approach with this with that location book there. Mm-hmm. What in general for the game, the way that it's set up is that there is a single sort of overarching concept in that all after a great war, all of the dark creatures and the dark lord that created them were locked beneath the 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 earth, right? Beneath the planet. Magical wards were put up to keep them there, problem solved. Now, the dwarves were not amused by this, but that's another story. 
So they were all locked down there. Well, recently, after a series of catastrophes, and as the years have gone by, those ancient wards are beginning to fail, and the dark creatures are returning to the world. And the problem is, is that the the great kingdoms, the merchant houses, the, the churches, the temples, they're not really equipped to deal with this uprising that's occurring. And so one really smart king, who refuses to call himself a king, High Lord Drakewin um, of Agthor, came up with this idea of making adventuring a respectable occupation. And at the Declaration of Talamain, he made it very clear that going forth, adventuring was an occupation one could choose, and that we needed adventurers to do the things that other people couldn't, and to go out there and, and do the tough jobs that maybe they weren't equipped to do at the time. And so you actually have the situation where these adventurers are, you know, basically picking up blade and spell book and going out just to save the people that they care about because someone has to do it and they've been given the okay to make that happen. Now, in your game, it may not turn out that everyone has, you know, gotten the memo that you're respectable and you may not have even gotten the memo. But the idea is that it's a pretty straightforward, simple concept that you're out there doing what needs to be done to help protect the people that you care about and the things that you've built. Mm -hmm. And so from that point, you can take the story anywhere you want. There's opportunities for political intrigue. There's opportunities for pirate adventures and exploration and everything else that you want to do. But that underlying concept is always there. So you always have a place to go. If you're like, well, what should we do next? You know what that thing is and you know how to dig into it. Everything else just adds opportunities and alternatives, but the underlying concepts are very simple and straightforward. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the, one of the thing one of the reason why I wanted to touch on different types of fantasy and why I made that um, joke joke earlier is um, let's con let's consider some consider for a moment the d the fantasy campaign settings that were u that were that were used for let's go let's go with eight let's go with the AD and D era whether it be for both for and since I'm I'm more familiar with AD and D second edition than than first mm -hmm. I'm seasoned but I'm not that seasoned <laughs> uh, let's consider let's consider uh, like I said eight AD and D um, second edition not not the default set not the default semi setting but rather the but rather the settings that were u that were utilized so mm -hmm. you have alquadim birthright dark sun diablo 2 technically <laughs> yeah yeah um dragonlance forgotten realms greyhawk um lankmar mistara planescape ravenloft and the crown and the crown jewel of bullshit Spelljammer. <laughs> okay. All of those are fantasy are fantasy settings. Yeah. On some level or another. That's where the similarities begin and end. Oh, and I, f I forgot about Odyssey. How could I forget about Odyssey? Is Hollow Earth its own thing, or is that really just part of the... Uh... Is that part of the Mystarist? I'm trying to remember. Um... Anyway, just one more. <laughs> I I need to double check where I put where I put the PDF I have for Hollow Earth. I don't think it's Mistara, but I could be completely wrong, so take that with a big ass grain of salt. Uh no, yeah, it looks like it's its own thing. I th I wasn't sure. I couldn't quite remember, but yeah, it looks like its own thing. So Hollow Earth as well. Yeah. Or Hollow World, sorry, Hollow World. Yeah, when you said Hollow Earth, I think that threw me off because I was thinking of Hollow Earth Expedition, which is a yeah, completely different I know. can of worms. I know, totally different. Hollow World is the one I was thinking of. But given th given that, I know you mentioned being inspired by classic fantasy, but if you had to put in put in different forms of media for a hypothetical appendix N for your setting, what would be some of the media that kind of fill it? Hmm. What would be the media that fills it? And I'm I'm talking books, TV shows, yeah. vid video games, fi films, plays, um, anything's on the table. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it, it's it's going to be the stuff that sort of falls into that 
classic Tolkien-esque fantasy realm. I mean, we're talking about things like Lord of the Rings. We're talking about things like the 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 old Dragonlance novels. We're talking about, you know, we. I don't know how to say this and make it sound right because because that's the biggest challenge I've always had. But the reality is that we just felt like there just wasn't enough of that, and we wanted to do more. Right, we wanted to do more Conan. We wanted to do more Fafford and the Gray Mouser with you know more D and D level magic. Of course, we wanted to do more uh, Terry Brooks. You know, we wanted to have more of these these sort of classic fantasy locations to explore and have it be part of a larger story that, rather than just growing up organically over time, was planned out to be part of something bigger. And that is a big part of this. Is that you know I think that's one of the pieces that we're looking at is you look at something like any of the Forgotten Realm stuff, and a lot of it did grow organically over time with a whole lot of people putting stuff in. But, you know, we wanted to build something where it was designed specifically to support gaming. So, you know, really any of those classic sort of fantasy storylines, that's really the type of stories we want to tell. Yeah. Now we've put in a lot of our own stuff. We've we've expanded out. We've created new ideas and new concepts and new lineages. But the underlying premise is this idea of sort of like a late 13th century world filled with monsters and magic and wonders to explore and, and countless ruins from ages past. Mm-hmm. And with that in, with that in mind. When it comes to when it comes to Agthor, when it comes to Agthor itself, I know you yeah. made com- you made comparisons to a uh, to a get to a gazette- to a gazetteer. Yeah. Within that, do you pl- do you plan on do you plan on going into detail of certain lo- certain locations like cities and settlements and and the points of interest within them? We are, and so, but what we're trying to do with Agthor is take a slightly different approach to it. And one of the challenges that I personally had, and this might just be me, but one of the challenges I often had with a lot of the location books is that it was such a mass of information to try to consume, and then to try to stick it all together in a way that made sense. You felt like you were constantly saying, and you meet this uh, Ligorian, and then you're like, say, oh, where are the Ligorians from, and what is their you know, culture and what are the limitations and how do I fit them into the world? It's this huge mass of information and countless pages of locations and forests and all of this stuff by setting. What I what I really wanted to do was instead of having this block of information, have something where you could very modularly reach in, open to a page and go, oh, this is a cool town. I'm going to use this. And maybe you use it in an Ataltus campaign or maybe you don't. But I want you to be able to pull it out by itself with nothing else connected to it and have it work. Now, I also want to build the threads and the frameworks where we have this framework throughout that holds all the pieces together. But that's kind of the big difference is that rather than trying to say, here's every city in the land, here's every location, we're like, here's a bunch of cool stuff in Agthor that you're totally going to want to have in your game rather than covering every single location. Yeah. Like a guidebook. Now... Do you would you pl- would you plan on having um, Agthor be be able to support a hex crawl? I would love to see that at some point. Now that's not what this is necessarily designed for, but uh, an Agthor hex crawl. Just because I'm a total nerd for hex crawls, I would totally love that. Right now, to be fair, Agthor is actually a, a companion book to the two other location books we've already put out which was the Heroes of Thornwall and then Defenders of Dunbury Castle, and now we have Guardians of Agthor. Um, those two, if you were to start in Thornwall and build out a hex crawl from that, I would love to see that someday. We just have to get this Kickstarter funded and be able to do our next thing. Mm-hmm. And now when it comes to the player-facing option, are you largely yeah. using the, the same... The same set, the same set of races that's in the player's handbook, or are there are there a, are there a few new playable races to account for? We've got we've got sort of the classic basics. So like we don't have like tieflings, for example, but we have elf, dwarf, humans, um, halflings mm-hmm. as the basics. Now keeping in mind that our the the lineages of of Ataltus came from two different places. 
the elves, the halflings, the dwarves, and a few others came from a Taltus. They're from there. But the humans and some of our others that I'll mention came through gates about 400 years earlier and to basically settle this land. And they came in here ready to help everybody, whether they wanted to help or not. And uh, it didn't go well across the board. And in the end, the gates that brought them there collapsed and exploded and left everyone trapped together on a Taltus. But we do have the basics, so humans and uh, dwarves, elves, halflings. But we also have a, a lineage called the Sitha, which are a native uh, lineage. They're a lizard folk, but they're more almost like dinosaur folk, I guess you might say, Saurian more than, than lizard. Uh, we've got some of the others that came through the gate with the humans, the Nuwarden, which are these strange sort of um bizarre grayish skinned uh spellcaster types they're very logical and they're the ones who actually built the gates that were used to bring the Atlan alliance through to a taltus there's the chibot which are uh, a group of sort of smaller almost goblin-esque if you ever wanted to play a fun goblin the chibot would be the the one that you'd want to play uh there's the droth mall which are again natives they're these huge creatures that worship the god Droth, that uh, the ice walkers do. And uh, they love, they see all of his, his punishments, all of the pain they suffer as his blessings. So we've got them. And then, of course, the elves are part of the fae, which includes sprites, fairies, and hopefully over time we'll be able to add some more of the forms. Sprite, fairy, and elf are the most common forms. So, you know, there's a lot of new stuff for people to explore as well. And yet, one of the things people say is like, I feel like I've played this before, but it's totally different. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what we're shooting for. We want you to feel comfortable, like you know what to do and you know how to play it, but there's just amazing new stuff to do. So, yeah, it's a mix of both the usual and then some cool new stuff. Oh, and one of my favorites, the ogres. Uh, Orogs are there when they're not in their dark form, uh, which is, you know, 10 foot tall, 9 foot tall, Hulk smash type of creatures that the Atlan brought through as sort of foot soldiers. No one's quite sure what their origin is, but they are trapped there as well. Mm -hmm. And that, with that in with that in mind, when it comes to when it comes to um classes, yeah, um, I know if I recall correctly, you do have a few subclasses that you've added in. But are there any are there any whole hog new classes within the setting? Yeah, we only added one because one of the things that I wanted is I didn't want to create a game that was so different from everything else for 5e that it ended up just clashing if you tried to bring in stuff from other areas. In fact, I did ridiculous amounts of math so that you could literally play basic 5e stuff right alongside a Talta stuff and it works great. Mm -hmm. Now, the one new class we created is a Mountebank. And the Mountebank is sort of like a bard, sort of like a rogue, but the whole idea is they are a con artist through and through. Everything they do, they do by talking people into things, by tricking people into things, by disguising, by fooling. They are the sort of swashbuckling rogue. They're not magicians. They're not really thieves. That's why we ended up saying this really needs to be a new class, not an archetype. And so the Mountebank is the one completely new class that we added to Ataltus. Which I can get, I can get that because even the, I know some people will argue why this is the case, but for for me, um, it never made it never made a whole lot of it never made a whole lot of narrative sense why rangers and bards are casters. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, I know th I know that one of the inspirations for the bard is the is the Pied Piper of Hamelin, and I've heard I've heard that some of the other inspirations are things like um skull things like scalds or Celtic priests. Which if that's the case, just, if that's the case, if you really wanted to do Celtic priests, um just do a just have a kit of cleric. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um But when it wasn't oddly enough, it wasn't until fourth edition that I that I started to accept the concept of 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 bardic magic and the approach that that 4e took was that was that you were ch you were essentially channeling um that co that collective mythos of fo of folk tales and fables and legends yeah within 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 di different cultures 
you know, much, and, much in the same way that fey creatures are are powered by belief in in certain settings and gods are powered by belief literally in um terry pratchett's work right yeah yeah and the thing is is that with the with the mountebank the thing i wanted is i didn't want to be tied to although i'm a musician i didn't want a character that was tied to music i didn't want a ter character that was tied to the arts or tied to magic i wanted you to have that like if you've watched the new lost in space the dr smith character right this this good at heart but really always kind of in it for themselves and you know willing to say and do anything to make a make a plan come together and i wanted that character in the game and you know no other class really fit it so you know they've got cool things like cloak defense they've got things like where they can bank a critical success as a as a point of divine in, or a point of inspiration you know instead they fail and it's sort of that whole idea where you know the the roguish character completely bombs one time but somehow pulls it off later and so it allows you to do that so there's some cool things in there like that that really makes it a unique character class and a lot of fun to play so my favorite anyway and i think i think a, i think a couple other examples that that could probably fit that particular archetype um one one that immediately comes to mind is Varric tethras from dragon age 2 mm -hmm. uh, and inquisition as as well but the the point is is that he very much has bar, has barred like leanings but he's one he's more of a talker and two he doesn't play an instrument at all mm -hmm. and tends to have a tends to have a knack for getting himself into and out of trouble using his mouth uh-huh yeah of course the the other the other one that the other one that came to mind is oh is oddly enough han solo for largely yeah. the same reasons <laughs> It, that's exactly it. And, you know, one of the things like, for example, we have a, a thing, it's almost like a social ranger is one way I've thought about it before, is that they actually have like a favored mark, the Khan does, the, the Mountebank does. So they'd be like, nobles, that's who I'm good at lying to, right? Or security personnel, or, you know, you have maybe have your favorite marks, you have these sort of things where they learn these expertise, but like, yeah, Han Solo is great, very, I mean... Any of those characters are a perfect example of the sort of character I wanted to be able to play and not get pulled into, like, the, I don't want to backstab, I don't want to sing or cast spells, I want to do something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I've, always, I've always been critical of this idea of bards needing to be, needing to be tied to an instrument or, or a form of performance, mm -hmm. because I think that misses the point of what a bard is. Yeah. At the end of the day, a bar a bard is a storyteller. It's just that music and music and the like is a form of it. You look at you look at a lot of old, a lot of old folk songs, and a lot of them are some type of story. And and of course, the, of course, theater is is fa is fairly obvious. But the, the point is is that the is that the storytelling I think should take focus more than the mute more than the music well and for what it's worth i actually have plans and have things put together for uh taking the classic bard and just sort of repositioning them not changing them but sort of repositioning them on how bardic colleges and things work within uh, a taltus and that is one of the things that i want to bring forward is this whole storytelling, telling ancient knowledge focusing refocusing on that as opposed to the the sort of you know, even the inspiration and things are cool, but at the, but at the end of the day, I feel there's more that you can do with it. More cool, sort of arcane uh, history and the the ancient secrets that people might not otherwise know. Now, given that style of classic fantasy, yeah, um, I'm curious if some of the more esoteric um, base classes would ha would have an easier or harder time fitting it fitting into the setting, um, especially think. Esp Something, something like a warlock, I could, I could easily, I could easily see. It's the classic deal with the devil that we've seen that in fiction countless times. But one of the well, warlock would be tough, actually, in a Taltus, and for a couple of reasons. You know, the first reason is that one of the things that we wanted to do for a 
you know, for meta reasons, although we built a story around it, is we wanted to eliminate dimension hopping and teleporting, right? We wanted people to be sort of stuck in the world that they're on and having to deal with it. Um, and so that eliminates opportunities to reach otherworldly sources of power. When it comes to demons, the dark creatures created by Androran is we have a pretty clear line between what's good and what's evil in this world. Now, they're still gray. They're still evil with a lowercase e, but the evil stuff is just plain evil, right? If you get involved with it, we actually have rules for corruption where it slowly corrupts your spirit and it changes you until you finally lose your character. It kills you and turns you into something else. And so, from that perspective, Warlock has always been one where we don't currently have description on how to play a Warlock in the world, but there are some ways you could do it. For example, avatars of the Inaros, the gods, are one possibility. Powerful dragons, for example, would be another way, the great dragons. So there are ways, but it is a little bit tricky. We do have to have our own way to handle Warlocks, which is why we didn't introduce them in the first Player's Guide when we came out with it. Yeah, and to, the, to that end... Um, since I I'd like to I'd like to go th I'd like to go through some of the base classes and and whether or not these would be an easier tri or trickier fit and ha and how. Yeah, um, sure. So I'll start with barbarian. Yeah, easy, very easy, not a problem at all. I mean, that's it's a classic, you know, uncouth by the measure of quote unquote civilized peoples uh barbarians absolutely fit the warrior that just goes nuts and just enjoys destroying their enemy and lives wild in the wilderness yeah i mean it totally can fit in fact the ice walkers many of the drothmal ice walkers are end up being barbarians mm -hmm. um well we already covered bard to an extent so i'll skip that yeah um cleric Oh yeah, absolutely. The clerics um, fit. We actually have divine, um, uh, divines. What's I'm sorry, I'm coming up blank. Uh, divine schools for each of the clerics, uh, each of the Anaros, the gods of Ataltus, and so all twelve of those are outlined in the player's guide. So it perfectly fits. It's an important part, and the rules are exactly the same. We don't do anything different with rules for clerics either. Um, Druid. Druid actually fits. In fact, it's one of the things that we'd hoped would get a stretch goal. We're actually voting for stretch goals on this Kickstarter. And right now, the Druids are in the lead to get added, the Druids of Agthor. Uh, Druids fit because they have a belief that the world itself has a spirit. And that it is more ancient and more powerful than the gods themselves. And they believe that's where they draw their magic from. So yeah, absolutely, Druids can fit. Mm -hmm. Um. This one's a bit of a no-brainer, but the, but the fighter. <laughs> fighter, yeah, sure. Fighters, it, it totally work. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, monks. This one Monk might be a little tricky. All right, so monks can work. There's a couple of different per, uh, points of view on this. First, there's something called uh, uh, Atlan Centering. And centering is a philosophy of finding balance between all things. And so within that, there are actually monks that we haven't gotten to talk about very much yet. But for example, there is actually a story about one of these fighting monk classes called the Kinjatsi uh, in our anthology, Champions of Ataltus. And so they absolutely fit. We just haven't really talked much about it yet, but I can't wait to add that. I also am looking forward to introducing our more Western style monks father tuck type of monks which is a something i think it's left out a lot and i'd like to see that brought in a bit more we've sort of hinted at it in a few places but hopefully yeah. we'll be able to introduce that as well just remember only you can stop florist friars <laughs> um, the paladin Absolutely. Uh, you know, a paladin is effectively just a, a warrior of the gods. And so from that point of view, they fit in perfectly. Mm -hmm. The ranger. Ranger definitely fits. Um, now, the ranger, as written in the standard D&D rules, with their spellcasting abilities, we treat them as a divine spellcaster that draws upon the powers of Grethkin, the uh, god of the wilderness, and Vale, the goddess of wild creatures. And so that sort of ranger is really sort of a uh, self-taught cleric of sorts. 
but since the magic system works the same for the rangers, it uses the same thing as divine. It doesn't really matter whether you call it arcane or divine, but at the end of the day, that's where that power comes from. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to have a non-magical ranger someday, but that's, again, more dreams down the road as we get you going here. You and a dozen other people. There, I, I, have, I have managed to find at least 24 third-party revisions of the ranger. Yeah. Which I... Th and that's not to get into the three times that that um, Wizards of the Coast have tried to fix it themselves. Yeah, that I mean, like I said, that's why it's on the I want to do it list. I, it's, I haven't tackled it yet, but, you know, there's lots of questions, too. Like, is Ranger just, is a non-magical Ranger just a fighter archetype, right, at um, the, the end of the day? I think that I think there's a place for the for the non-magical Ranger. I don't, I don't think having it being a fighter archetype would, is... It's certainly a way to do it, but I feel like there's something missing by doing that. Yeah. Um, the this one, sh I think this one's a no another no-brainer, but the rogue. Yep, absolutely. Rogues are easy. They fit. They're everywhere. Um, sorcerer. Sorcerer, yes, sorcerer is there. In fact, there was an ancient form of magic um, before the type of glyph magic that's used by arcane spellcasters today. Um, during the Age of Magic. And uh, that sort of spellcasting was unique to the, was learned by and discovered by the Fae. Uh, and so there is actually a different type of spellcasting that we haven't introduced yet, and that is where sorcerers are going to come in. We just haven't brought that in yet. Now, if someone wanted to play a sorcerer, it works mechanically, and you can just say, they're using Fae magic, and just go with it, because honestly, our goal here is to say yes to whatever cool things you want to do in your game and find ways to make it work. Uh, but yeah, the sorcerer would work. We just haven't touched on that yet. Yeah. Um, warlock. Yeah, we talked a little about warlock. Now, one of the things about warlock is, you know, there's part of the reason why I haven't gone into it is I haven't decided whether they're going to use the standard arcane spellcasting rules that we put together, the glyph magic rules, which when we hit wizard, I'll talk about, but or whether they are effectively a divine caster and the key difference here is that when you are casting a spell using arcane magic you are actually creating a glyph in a mechanical fashion using skills that you've learned and then forcing essence through it to create a magical effect divine magic is inspired it comes to you you do it if someone asks you how you do it you can't really explain it to them it's just the gods acting through you and in a sense that's kind of what a warlock is right it's their patron acting through them. So I, I will say it absolutely can fit, and I'm making a way for it to fit in a way that'll work so folks can do it. But I haven't decided on what the story aspect of that's going to be yet. Mm -hmm. And the wizard. Sorry. Wizard. I had, to, I had to get that joke out of my system. <laughs> Yes, absolutely, wizards. But one of the things that that I never quite liked was when arcane and divine magic felt exactly the same. And so one of the things I always wanted to do was create a world where magic is more of this skill-based uh, thing that you learn, a technique that you learn that maybe you have a natural affinity for before you can use it. And I wanted to be able to uh, have moments in the game such as like spell casting in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, where they pull out a book with a spell they've never seen before and cast a spell from it, and having spells that go wildly wrong if you get in over your heads, and you know having spells where you exhaust yourself over time. Um, not was never a fan of the sort of Vancean slot based because my brain could never come up with a good logical reason for it, even though I've read all of Vance's books. In the end, I wanted to have this point-based approach, and so that's what we have today, is we have something called Glyph Magic, which is a point-based magic system. It um, can be run alongside the normal magic, because we've balanced it in such a way that you know the skill roll tends to make up for the fact that you have more opportunities to cast spells. Uh, critical failures on skill rolls trigger... Uh, disastrous results, you know, similar to what the sorcerers have, but a slightly uh, different approach to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually cast spells higher than your level. It's just a matter of how difficult is it and how many of your essence points it's going to eat away at. And one of the challenges is that everyone's spirit functions as sort of an essence vessel. 
And when you use up all the essence that sort of naturally flowed into your essence vessel that is your body, you can still cast spells, but then it starts unraveling the vessel itself, which means you take points of damage from hit points. And so we have had some glorious moments where wizards have given everything to save the party, going like, look, I'm going to try to cast a fireball, and it might kill me, so someone try to revive me when this is done, because if I don't do it, we're all going to die. And just some really cool heroic moments where you can do things like that. Allows, it unlocks the ability to do things like we've got ley lines, so you can tap a ley line to draw energy from it. You've got essence wells, which are these areas where there's more magic welling up than in other areas. Your magic recovers faster. Dragons like to uh, layer upon these things when they find them. And essence voids, where there's no magic, and all magical effects cease to function. So having this in here is a way to make arcane magic its own thing separate from divine magic and feel very different and it's been a lot of fun to play that and see other people playing it and you're already speaking my language by by mentioning that you're doing us that you're doing a point-based system instead of the vancian model because i'm i've been perfectly fine with the vancian model in certain settings mm -hmm. if you're doing if you're doing conan south sword and sorcery where magic is barely under understood and very dangerous yeah, go right, go right ahead. It, it's not going to be. It wouldn't be my first choice personally, but I can buy it. When you're when it's in a high fantasy setting where magic is supposed to be everywhere in some fo and a na and a and a natural part of the world, one that one that pe one that people one that people are able to draw upon fairly easily, and there's magic items everywhere. I have a hard time buying that. Yeah. Uh like consider, consider say Eberron, which is very, which is very magic steampunk in its approach, and that and magic based technology is everywhere. Why why is that why is that using the Vancian model other than tradition? Yeah. Oh. And when you when you say when you say that glyph magic is utilized how is is glyph magic akin to a, akin to a rune or is it akin to magic as a language how would it be visualized yeah so it actually it is like a rune and in fact so originally magic came from an anaros called an Androrn. just give you a quick little quick backstory so it all makes sense when i explain it came from an anaros named Androrn. He gave magic to everyone, and they could basically do whatever they could imagine. Whatever they had the will to create, they could. And the other gods are like, uh, we're not cool with that. You need to take that away. And he says, well, I'm not going to, and leave me alone. I, you, know, you wouldn't let me give them my gift, so I gave it to them in secret. Which was the beginning of the end for Androrn, who eventually fell to the power of darkness uh, as things went south with him and the other gods. Um, and so part of this is what happened is one of the elven queens tried to make herself a god using this magic and Drone gave them and had a horrible disaster that destroyed her kingdom that is called the Elian Wilds today. And the gods saw this and went, all right, that's it. We're putting something in place that is now called the Ritual of Limitation by the people of the world that basically limits how magic can be used. And so what that did is it meant that that sort of think-it-and-do-it magic no longer existed. One of the first things that was discovered was rune magic by the dwarves, where they literally would carve runes and fill them with metals, uh, various magical metals, and then force essence through them to create a magical effect in the real world. And so those sorts of rune magic still exist today, and we just haven't released the rules for that yet. But you find these runes throughout the Deeplands where the dwarves used to live on rune boats, which are these stone boats that can float through. Now, when the Outlon came, their form of magic was almost just like that. But what they do is they draw some of their personal essence off, just enough of it, to form this glyph, which, only, which exists only in the essential plane. And they create this glyph, and then they draw essence out of themselves, which is their essence vessel, and then push it through the glyph. And the glyph shapes it into a magical effect. And so that's the way that these glyphs work. And so you've got arcane colleges where people spend their lives studying how to make a single glyph 
right? How to improve upon a spell, how to make something else. It's why people guard them with their lives. And keep in mind that part of why we built a lot of this, and for all of Atultus, there is a large meta element built into it that we hope is so wrapped in cool story that it doesn't stand out. But for example, we wanted magic to be somewhat scary. And well, it was given to them by the guy who eventually became the Lord of Darkness. So a lot of people aren't confident that magic is a good idea, which is why magic isn't everywhere, right? Which is one of the things that you wonder, like, why isn't there more magic in a D&D world? Well, that's one of the reasons. Also, spells can go horribly wrong. You watch one wizard nuke himself and leave a giant crater in the middle of town. The next guy who comes into town and offers to create a continual light for you, you might be like, good, I've got a torch. I'm <laughs> fine, thanks anyway, right? And so that's sort of the vision of it, is this creating this, this glyph in the central plane and pushing the match through to shape it into something that affects the physical plane. Mm -hmm. Now, with, that, with all that in mind, mm -hmm. when, it, when it comes to, when it comes to, spe when it comes to um, spell casting, yeah. in, in your particular approach, um, what would what would se what would separate so what would separate a so a um, sorcerer from a wizard right so the thing that would separate is i believe that sorcerers are going to be drawing on raw essence and using a weakened form of true magic which is the original form of magic where instead of thinking about it in terms of glyphs and math and science and shapes and you know repeated processes it's more of an instinctual process and you're drawing on the raw essence in the air around you now the challenge there is that some of that is corrupted from the age of darkness that problem is some of this is too powerful and you could potentially harm yourself by drawing on this magic but you would have a lot of flexibility to sort of do new and different things with your magic. And so that's the key difference there. Um, it also is something that I've very much considered keeping limited to Fae, unless you have some sort of very unique background, which a lot of adventurers do. But again, it's a it's a form of Fae magic. Mm -hmm. And with the, now with that in mind, when it comes to when it comes to Agthor, mm -hmm. um, Stretch goals notwithstanding, what are you shooting for as far as a page count? So right now, the minimum we're looking at is about 152 pages. Although it, in our experience, we tend to go over, which is why we're shooting for 152 pages. Um, we've never hit our page count. We've always gone beyond. But that's, that's our basic that we're shooting for. Yeah. And to be fair, nobody ever hits their page count. It's, you know, the problem for me is it's like, ah, uh, you know, it's going to be a little more expensive. We won't make quite, well, we never make anything. We just pay back the artists and stuff. But it's like, uh, do I really want to hold back? Like, I've got these 10 pages of great content written. I really want people to have it. So I end up adding it anyway. So maybe it's not the best business move. But at the end of the day, how can you not? I mean, it's, we're doing this because we love it. So. Mm -hmm. So. And with that in with that in mind, would you be shoot would you be shooting for a release date of twenty twenty three? So we've said March twenty twenty three. Um, our last Kickstarter between COVID and everything else, and the fact that we'll never do six books all at the same time again, which was a horrible mistake for a small group. Um, we wanted something that we could we could definitely knock out as quickly as possible. We'd love to get it out sooner. But we chose a date that we said, let's be conservative and know that no matter what happens, we know we can hit that. So March 2023 is our current targeted release date for Guardians of Agthor. All right. And I will certainly look forward to seeing how to seeing how that de how that develops and how it will interact with the rest of the, with the rest of the setup. But with all that said, I would like yeah. to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And oh, yeah. anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule 
to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>